15 minutes. Yeah. That's like homecoming for you. Uh, it, it is. <laughs> it's, it's a good sign. The walk, it's a sign. It's a welcome back. Yeah. Welcome back yeah. to Lynn. Chairs up here if anybody's interested. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us at the Democus Family YMCA. A big Y shout out to Governor Healy. Our Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll, Secretary Gorkowitz, and Dr. Tutwiler, Secretary Tutwiler, who's here today. We welcome him back to Lynn. I'm Kathleen Walsh. I'm President and CEO of the YMCA of Metro North. You are in our most recent building that we just opened a year and a half ago. So if you have some time, take a look around. Before I get into my very, very brief comments, I want to recognize some of the folks that are here in the room. We have our mayor, somewhere he's here, um, our mayor, Jared Nicholson, and the entire Lynn delegation is here. Thank you for that. Uh, we have Kate Marie Roycroft, who is the CEO of the Alliance of Massachusetts YMCA's. Uh, we have a lot of our staff, particularly the Democus team led by Andrea Baez, who really made this possible. We're excited for all the work that they have done. We have my friends and colleagues from the Lynn Education District, and we have some Y Board members, so thank you. And my favorite spectator somewhere is my daughter, Johanna, is here today. <laughs> my message today is simple. Thank you. Thank you for your shared commitment to children and families, education, and workforce development. That's who we are and why we're all here. If you don't know, this YMCA is one of 28 across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We share the work values of youth development, healthy living, and social responsibility. In one year alone, we serve over 500,000 youth under the age of 18. Because of your commitment to us, we're able to continue our work, and we hope we can count on you for the generations to come. Next, we want to be your partner a partner in advancing opportunity for the cities and towns that we serve. Partnering in work that's inclusive, impactful, inspirational, intentional, and certainly innovative. Please invite us to be your thought partners, problem solvers, and solution-driven leaders as we all collectively work to make Massachusetts the best state to live, work, and raise a family. I know you didn't come here to hear me, so I get to introduce Governor Healy. We, uh, Attorney General Healy came and visited our camp maybe six months ago in Peabody, where she talked to some of our youth about workforce development funds that we had received so that they can work for us. It was a really great opportunity for her to see some of the work that we do. Today, I proudly introduce Governor Healy, who is at our Demarcus Family YMCA, and who knows, in four years, it could be President Healy. So come on up. Thanks, Kathleen. Well, good morning, everyone. And Kathleen, it is wonderful to be here. It is always great to be at a Y. That was, uh, that was a really nice day this summer. It's a little bit warmer. Um, but we have bright skies here today, and that is, uh, that is what we love to see. I, I want to thank Kathleen and the entire team at the YMCA Metro North. Um, you guys do tremendous work day in and day out, serving the entire range of, of community. Today we're here to talk about some of the, the youngest among us, but I just want to acknowledge the work that the Y does in serving families across the spectrum of services uh, year round. It is really, really terrific. And thank you to the staff who did uh, the work this morning to, to manage our, our uh, time here with all of you. To our colleagues in government, uh, we are grateful for the opportunity to partner with you, to the mayor, 
Um, appreciate you being here, Mayor Nicholson, Senator Crichton, Representatives Wong, uh, Armini, uh, Governor's Council Terry Kennedy, um, and others who have joined us uh, representing government. It's, it's all about working together. And the work we're able to do in collaboration at the state and local level is what is really going to power this Commonwealth forward. So thank you for being here. And a huge thanks this morning to our team. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, I are particularly grateful to those who have spent many, many hours over the last several weeks to put together this tax package and our budget, uh, led by our administration and finance secretary, Matthew Gorkowitz, and his terrific team. Um, and we're also excited to be back in uh, Secretary Tutwiler's stomping grounds. He returns to you, having been the superintendent here of, of Lynn Public Schools, as your secretary of, of education. So we're delighted to have both secretaries with us here this morning. Um, I mentioned, um, I mentioned the, the impact of, of the Lynn branch of, of the Y. Um, you know, I think we know more than ever that opportunities are becoming harder and harder to come by for any number of families across this state because of the high cost of living. And the families who rely on the Y and similar facilities across the state and the hardworking staff who run these programs day in and day out need our support. Everywhere we go, the Lieutenant Governor and I hear about the cost of living and how it's impacting communities, how it's skyrocketing past people. The young mom who wants to return to her dream job but can't afford childcare. The recent college grad who can't make both his rent and his student loan payments. The senior who wants to stay in the home where they raise their family but can't keep up with property taxes. The small business owner contemplating moving to another state that has less burdensome taxes. The commuter who takes the train into the city for work every day. The dairy farmer whose livelihood is subject to the whim of fluctuating prices. These are all stories and they're representative of what's going on around our state. That includes two folks you're going to hear from shortly, Ro Rosa and Rosaria, um, who you'll hear from. Rosa is a single mom to two boys, ages 6 and 11. She works here at the Y. And she's going to share with you exactly what this tax package means for her. Um, Rosario is the caretaker of her elderly parent. And she, too, will share what this tax package means for her and her family. When we developed this tax package, this proposal, we had three primary considerations, affordability, competitiveness, and equity. We asked ourselves, how can we deliver the most amount of savings for the most amount of people? What reforms do we need to make Massachusetts more competitive and to retain and attract more people and businesses to our state? And how can we target this relief so it's reaching the people who need it most? I'm excited to share with you the result of these discussions. On Wednesday, we will be filing the $750 million Healy Driscoll tax relief package. The hallmark of this package is relief that will go directly to families, seniors, and those struggling with the high cost of housing. That starts with the Child and Family Tax Credit, a new benefit that will provide families with a $600 credit annually per dependent. This includes children under 13, people with disabilities, and senior dependents age 65 and older. Our proposal will also simplify the process by combining two existing benefits, the Household Dependent Tax Credit and the Dependent Care Tax Credit. We would remove the existing cap on dependents and increase this benefit. We estimate that this will put more money back in the pockets of 700,000 taxpayers in connection with more than a million dependents. Notably, the Child and Family Tax Credit would make sure that large families are not excluded from receiving the full amount of support they need. And it will benefit black and brown families who are more likely to rely on informal child care and have been left out of pre-existing credits. Our administration believes that this new benefit will have significant impacts in helping families keep up with rising costs and making ends meet. We're also offering direct relief for seniors dealing with high housing costs. We propose doubling the senior circuit breaker from $1,200 to $2,400 for low-income seniors with high property taxes or rent. This will help an estimated 100,000 households. 
and help seniors stay in those homes. And for renters, we propose raising the rental deduction currently capped at 50% of rent up to $3,000 to $4,000. This increase will help offset the high costs for 880,000 renters around our state. In addition, our package also includes a number of other relief measures. Again, it's targeted at those who need it most. For commuters, we propose adding regional transit passes and bike expenses to the list of expenses that qualify for tax deductions, such as tolls and MBTA passes. For farmers, we propose increasing the statewide cap from $6 million to $8 million so that the state can offer more assistance to protect our dairy farmers from wholesale milk price fluctuations. For those with student debt, we propose to exempt any assistance with student loan repayment that borrowers receive from their employers from income tax. For gateway cities, and this is very important, for gateway cities, we propose to increase the annual cap on the housing development incentive program, these are HDIP credits, from $10 million to $50 million. That's important work that's gonna help us unlock more market rate housing in our gateway cities. We're also proposing reforms to apprenticeship tax credits, live theater tax credits, Title V tax credits, those are for septic systems, uh, lead paint abatement, hard cider tax rates, and the Brownfields tax credit program. We have to acknowledge that there are some aspects of our current tax system that make Massachusetts an outlier. That's something we've talked about and heard a lot of talk about. And so we undertook an effort to address that very landscape. When we don't keep up with other states, you see, we put our own competitiveness at risk. It drives our businesses and our residents out of the state. So our team worked hard on this and we proposed narrowing in on a couple of um, current taxes that make Massachusetts an outlier compared to other states. Here's what we're proposing. Eliminating the estate tax for all estates valued at up to $3 million. Massachusetts is one of only 12 states that has an estate tax and shares the lowest threshold of those 12 with the state of Oregon. So we're one of only 12 and we're the lowest along with the state of Oregon. So that's on the estate tax. Second, short-term capital gains. We propose reducing short-term capital gains from 12% to 5%. Why? Well, it's consistent with long-term capital gains and other income. Second, Wisconsin and South Carolina are currently the only other two states in the country that tax short-term capital gains at a higher rate than long-term capital gains. That's what we're doing here. That's what we're looking to change. Look, Massachusetts has always been a national leader in education, in business, in science, in technology, in democracy and civil rights. But simply put, we're not leading when it comes to affordability. Too many other states are passing us by and that hurts our ability to compete. That's why we're prioritizing these reforms. Our administration is confident that the package we put forward today will make significant progress on the goals of driving affordability, driving competitiveness and driving equity in Massachusetts. Most importantly, these reforms will make a real difference in the lives of families across the state. And that's what this is all about, relieving some of the economic pressures that are squeezing too many people and holding us back from reaching our true potential. This tax package is a values proposition. It's a values proposition from our administration. We believe it's a value proposition for this state. We're about listening to the needs of our residents and our communities. We're about centering those who disproportionately are impacted by these difficult economic times. And we're about making good on our commitment to the people of Massachusetts that we're gonna follow through. Again, I wanna thank the team at ANF, especially Secretary Gorkowitz and his staff who spent the past two months working tirelessly to put this package together along with our budget. We look forward to continuing to work closely with our partners in the legislature on shared goals of delivering relief and affordability for residents across the state. 
And now I'd like to turn it over to uh, my great teammate and your fabulous Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll. Thank you, Governor. It's great to be uh, here in Lynn. I think uh, beyond the Lynn delegation, I had the shortest commute here. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for that. And we're so pleased to be here. We know the importance of WISE in our communities. As a longtime Y board member in Salem, we know the work that goes on in this building really benefits not only the families, the youth, the seniors who take advantage of all the wonderful programs here, but frankly, citywide, those efforts. And we wanted to share this work with you the folks who live not only in Lynn, but people across Massachusetts, and recognize the importance of having a budget and a policy that's going to make our state more affordable, more competitive, and more equitable. And you know, I think we have a lot of gratitude that we're in a position to actually help. Last week, um, as many of you know, we announced historic investments in local aid, benefiting our cities and towns, and our K through 12 education system, some of the highest funding totals we've ever seen to benefit uh, our secondary education. That's great news for our local officials. That's great news for the number of students who are attending public school who will be benefiting from those dollars. And over the course of the next several days, we'll be detailing the full scope of our budget proposal the next fiscal year for the next fiscal year. That's going to include significant investments in workforce development, in education beyond our, our K through 12 system, early ed, higher ed, transportation, investments to meet our climate goals. You know, for for us, budgets are really a value proposition. It's a statement. It's, it's about making our state more affordable uh, with these tax reductions. That's part of the whole package, the investments we're going to make and the way we can reduce costs for people who really need it. And we wanted to start here in Lynn today to spend time with folks who will be helped by our tax proposals. The families who come to the Y for child care, the seniors who come here to stay strong and healthy, the workers, the employees here at the YMCA who do these, who run these critical programs and make sure they run smoothly. And as I said, as a Y member, I know how, not only a Y member, a Y board member and a Y member, I know how critical it is. Um, folks who use this building every day, many of whom are struggling with the high cost of living, are the people who will benefit most from the tax proposals that the governor just discussed. Now, um, we just detailed many of the most exciting reforms to put money that's going to go right back directly in people's pockets. That child care tax credit is meaningful resources at a time when people need it most. But I want to highlight um, one of the programs that I'm really excited about, the Housing Development Incentive Program, or HDIP as we talked about it. Mayor Nicholson and I had a moment when the governor mentioned it, right? I got the thumbs up. Um, and that's because we've heard from so many local leaders of gateway cities about the importance of the HDIP program. It is a way to invest in places like gateway cities that were regional economic hubs. Many of you know my father uh, is from Lynn, proud West Linner, and I recall the stories about Union Street. When Lynn was the shoe capital of the USA, shoulder to shoulder, you could not get down the streets hustling and bustling downtown. I see heads nodding of others who, who know that same story. The HDIP program provides the vital resources we need to bring back these regional economic hubs where the industrial era landed, and it's taken a little bit longer to come out of that, that particular phase of economic activity. It allows for new construction of much needed housing, a lot of which will be affordable to community members in places that need it most, restoring that vibrancy downtown. We've already seen how impactful this program is that's led to the development of thousands of housing units in downtowns and transit hubs around Massachusetts. As I said, our gateway cities, Holyoke, Fall River, New Bedford, Lynn, Salem, Peabody, just to name a few, there are over 30. We know that we've heard from mayors loud and clear the importance of this program. It, the tax credit program right now is currently at $10 million a year. And what we've seen is the program has been oversubscribed, so much so that there's a backlog. At this time, when housing creation is so critical and also so costly, rising inflation, rising interest rate makes it harder to get deals done. By increasing this program to $50 million, we'll be able to tackle a lot of that backlog, enhance additional housing units, and then keeping it at $30 million moving forward means we're going to triple the amount of housing development investment tax credits available to our gateway cities. As a result, we hope we can develop thousands more housing units. That's going to generate billions in real estate investments, a whole lot of new growth for our cities and towns, and most importantly, that vibrancy we want in cities that are just brimming with potential. This is a big plus. I want to thank our partners in local government, our mayors who made their voices loud and clear about the need for this funding, the advocacy, and the difference maker it can be in a community. 
And it, I think it's just one of the examples of the way our tax package is going to have a tangible impact on the quality of life in the places that people live. Meaningful investments, housing units, an opportunity to contribute to a thriving downtown. There's a lot to like about HDIP and so many of the tax proposals included in this package. We're excited uh, about leading the state at a time when we know there's so much optimism and so much promise, and we're really ready to get this done. Uh, thrilled to be joined with Rosario and Rosa to tell a little bit more about how this tax package, tax package is going to benefit them um, you know, at home at a time when uh, that you, we all could use uh, a little bit more. So I'll invite them both to the podium to say a few words. Rosa, do you want to come first? Thank you, Governor Haley and Lieutenant Driscoll, Governor Driscoll, for visiting the Metro YMCA here in Lynn today. My name is Rosa Robles, and I'm a single mother of two boys, 11-year-old Jaden and 7-year-old Yandel. We live in Lynn. I work as a director of social responsibilities here at the Y, and I love my job. We are welcoming to everyone work really hard to meet people's needs and help them be active members of their communities. We offer volunteering, coaching, and mentoring programs for kids. We support immigrants and new survivors to our community. We do community service projects to give back to others in need. Even though I work full time, I still struggle to make ends meet as a single mom of two. Recently, it seems like the cost of everything is going up with no end sight, groceries, gas, rent, everything. That's why I'm so happy to hear that Governor Haley's child and family tax credit proposal, that would be an additional $1,200 back in my pocket every year. That money would be a lifeline help for me for less stress about me going to pay, how I'm going to pay groceries, fill my tank, or even pay my rent. I also know many of my friends and neighbors in the community would benefit from this as well. It would be really amazing and a huge help to us, so thank you. I'm grateful for the Governor Haley and Lieutenant Governor Driscoll for prioritizing families and helping us get some sort of relief for raising costs. Thank you, guys. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Rosario Viera Minaya, and I'm the executive director of Raw Artworks here in Lynn. It is a youth arts organization that has been in the community for over 34 years. I'm just taking the helm of that organization uh, this past year. And uh, we are rooted in art therapy and mental health support for our youth. I'm also the former executive director of Amplify Latinx, a statewide organization, and a nonprofit leader who had led several nonprofits here in the North Shore area. I'm also a North Shore resident. Uh, but today, I'm here as a daughter and um, telling you a little bit about my experience caring for my dad. My husband and I are the primary caregivers for my 89-year-old dad. He's up there, <laughs> and he's wonderful. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's 10 years ago, and we have been caring for him for the past two years. He came to us from Florida. My, my brother used to care for him over there. Um, one of the reasons I left my previous job, actually, was to be closer to my dad here in the North Shore and be more attentive to his care. I also have to move from my previous uh, residence to a home that is more suitable for, um, in terms of living space for his needs, his physical needs especially. My dad has been a role model to me, my family, my community. He's an outstanding father to my siblings and, and myself, and just an overall great human being. We are so grateful to be able to care for him in our home. Uh, but uh, also, we have two children, uh, both teenagers in high school, and uh, having the opportunity to have the family all together at home has been interesting <laughs> and uh, <laughs> challenging. So uh, as rewarding as that can be, it's also, like I said, very challenging. And I feel this past year has been more challenging than ever. Even though we, um, my husband and I, we both work full time and we have a steady incomes, and my husband is actually a nurse, He's in, uh, he can support in many different ways, uh, the care for my dad. Uh, everything has been going up, groceries, medicine, gas, housing, and it has been difficult to figure out how we're gonna keep up every month. And if that's the case for us, uh, I cannot even imagine what's happening with other families that don't have a steady incomes or uh, a two household income. On top of that, um, we are first generation immigrants who have no generational wealth. So we have been building from scratch, planning and figuring out what we need to put in place now for my dad's progressing care has been stressful, especially knowing that we have other equally important priorities like saving for our two kids' college education. 
things piled up quickly and constantly, and I, it's hard to prioritize and keep up. My dad needs us, um, and we are in the midst of navigating a complex system of elderly care and support here in Massachusetts. This is something that is certainly keeping us up at night. Um, and I'm just one of the many stories of individuals like me, like my husband, who are coming into stage in our lives when we are faced with aging parents and their needs. I hear stories every day from my friends and family uh, and uh, others in my community, uh, same stories. I was so happy to hear about Governor Haley's child and family tax credit proposal. That will mean an additional 600 back into our pockets every year. That money will go uh, into helping with sourcing for um, other needs that my father has, like special care needs, specialized products that are essential for his care, and also medications. Anything can help at this point, and it is really a relief. I'm grateful for the governor and lieutenant governor uh, for prioritizing our families, especially prioritizing my dad in this uh, news and uh, this announcement. And it, it is really important for our community to get some relief in this rising cost. So thank you so much to everyone, especially governor and lieutenant governor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosa and Rosario, for sharing what this is really all about. Um, because behind every figure, behind every number, is is a person, and that's what the value value proposition is really about. That's what budgeting is all about for all of us. Um, and so, with that, I, I thank them. I thank our team, and uh, we're happy to take questions. I think it's a, it's a start of a conversation. I think that a lot has changed. The landscape has changed over the last year. Uh, we looked at this, and again, it's a matter of Massachusetts competitiveness. And we want all of our residents to thrive and have the opportunity to, um, to live the kind of life that they want, that they want for, for their kids. We want our businesses to thrive. We want people to stay here in Massachusetts. We want people to come to Massachusetts. But part of the calculus of whether you're gonna come to Massachusetts or stay in Massachusetts is whether you can afford it. And we looked at what other states were doing and this is about our competitiveness. And this is a way, um, in addition to, to addressing the outlier that we are with the estate tax, of putting us on a more level playing field with other states, which is really key to our competitiveness. I think we put together a really sensible tax relief package. Um, it's covered, it's paid for in the budget, so we're very comfortable with that. You also have to think about you know, uh, a few things when it comes to this landscape. We are putting money back in the pockets of people who really need it most, in addition to providing some other reforms that will really help us as a state be more competitive. But with every dollar going back in the pocket of a resident or a family here, that's also money that they can spend. That's also money that is gonna keep them um, and keep their family going. And so, you know, you have to think about that in the context of, of analyzing and assessing tax relief. These are reforms um, that we believe uh, are going directly at the heart of affordability. Uh, the Lieutenant Governor, for example, mentioned the HDIP program. I mean, that is just a wonderful, wonderful program that will do so much for our communities, and in doing so, so much for residents, for families across the state. So that's that's what this is about. The package is $750 million. That's what we estimate it to be. It's covered and paid for in the budget. Um, obviously, there are a few different revenue streams this year that, that we're looking at, but we feel it's a really uh, sensible plan and proposal, it gets at the issues of affordability, at our competitiveness, and also equity. When you look at some of the relief that we're targeting here, doubling the circuit breaker for seniors, helping out renters, more than close to 900,000 renters in our state alone, the child tax credit, I mean, that's a, a hugely powerful, as you just heard, these are real people with real stories talking about the real impact that will have on their bottom line. Um, this kind of relief, we think, really centers equity 
you know, at, at, uh, uh, in the work of this, this budget. So we're excited about it. Look forward to, to talking more about it and certainly to talking to our colleagues in the legislature about it. I know that we have been focused on, and this new administration has been very focused on the last uh, a few weeks, um, the start here of, of our administration, on a uh, what we believe is a very sensible tax package in addition to a budget proposal. So that's that's really where we focused our efforts, and you know we'll continue to uh, to engage in that over the course of of several days, weeks, months as we engage in, in hearings and, and discussion. Uh, over what we put forward, and I'm sure others will have uh, their own ideas uh, to, to add to this. Well, I, I think that, that the reforms we speak about, um, including the child tax credit, including what we've done with, with the estate tax, what we're proposing to do, what we, we're proposing to do with short-term capital gains, um, even the HTIP program, I mean, all these things we, we think should not be one-time um, events. These are things that, that we think should be part of uh, lasting reform here in the state that will, again, drive our affordability, drive our competitiveness, and set our equity at what we do. And so. We are really uh, excited about uh, about the package, about the proposal, and again, look forward to, to what will be ongoing discussions with, with colleagues in the legislature um, as we as we debate and discuss this over the coming weeks. Well, I think nothing is off the table. Um, you know, we went with the child tax credit because we believe that it would cover more families, more residents. Um, but, you know, I think anything that, that gets at affordability right now, that gets at driving down the high cost of living for residents around the state, that will incent more people to come here, to stay here, to grow families here, to go to school here and stay here, to grow businesses here, that's where we want to be. And, I think in conversations, you know, around the state with, with a range of folks, you know, I think we've, we think there's a lot of consensus around that. There's a lot of understanding that this is what we need to do as a state in order to move our residents and our commonwealth forward. Yeah, um, you know, I think what you have seen from us and what you will continue to see is transparency. Uh, people may not always like the news, but we are going to be straight and direct about what is happening as we learn. And so we put that information out for commuters so that people can plan their days and, and their travel um, and, and commute. And so that's what that was about. Obviously, uh, we're working to address those, those deficiencies. Uh, we've talked before about the hiring of the GM, um, and I am here to assure you that will happen very soon. But it's a lot more than just hiring a GM and a transportation safety chief. It is about dealing with some of the real workforce issues. Uh, we're trying to bring real intentionality and, and energy to that. We really need people out there um, at a range of positions um, in order to, to get people to where they need to go. And um, this is not an easy uh, situation. This is a challenging situation, and I understand, I understand the frustration of folks out there across the state, um, whether you're looking to use the T or the commuter rail um, or other modes of transportation, and that's why we've made this a priority, and we're going to be really dogged about pursuing that. Yeah, the blizzard of 78. You know, I had my birthday canceled. <laughs> it was my seventh, my seventh uh, uh, birthday, and, and we had a big party plan, and school got canceled for days, it turned out. But uh, when, when we were back on, boy, did we have a great sledding party. Uh, fortunately, we're not looking at that for tomorrow, but um, certainly we've had our discussion and our briefing, and that'll continue this afternoon. And 
uh, appreciate the work out there. You know, a lot of work goes on in terms of pre-treating for these scenarios, and so I appreciate all the work that's done um, to, to keep our roads and, and our highways uh, clear, um, also deal with some of the power line issues and the, and the like. And as with uh, all storms or potential events, we just want to make sure people are safe, look after, look in on one another, and we will be out with more information later today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.